Thanks very much, Machi. So um, please uh, stop me and ask questions. It's much more interesting if people ask questions. So if, we don't, if I don't finish, then I think that we'll have a much more interesting talk if, uh, if I don't manage to finish because of discussion. So um, I confess that I only, uh, I only finished this talk uh, at about half past 11 this morning. And uh, the reason for that was I really was struggling to write this talk. I kept thinking, how do I, what talk do I give? Because I realized that normally when I give a talk, I'm selling something. I'm either, when I'm speaking to school children, I'm selling that science is wonderful. When I'm speaking to colleagues, I'm trying to sell my work to them. And when I speak to graduate students, I'm selling them on a specific technique. But I realized the audience here today, I was, I was very unsure of, you know, what could I give you that would be of any value? So, so, that's, uh, so the talk that I'm going to give is going to be a bit vague because I, I was trying to search for something that would, would have some value for you. So it would help if you ask questions about what interests you, because then uh, if I've made a mistake uh, about what actually interests you, I can kind of autocorrect. Okay. The other reason I think it's very difficult to speak to amateur astronomers, because in a sense, amateur astronomers are the purest astronomers, because you're not getting paid for it, which the rest of us are paid for what we do. Um, and so I didn't want to just give you the usual you know, kind of spiel that I give to funding agencies, etc., about why cosmology is wonderful. So I'm going to try and cut to what I think are, are some of the interesting trends that are happening in cosmology. And I think uh, this, uh, this kind of represented my attempt to get to doing a good talk, but like the, the squirrel in Ice Age never quite getting there. Well, let's hope that I get there. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> one of the things that one deals with the general public uh, is uh, some level of ignorance. Um, I ran a school in cosmology recently, and I got this uh, on Facebook. I got this request. Are you a beauty school? Because I would like to find out more about your beauty course. And in a sense, that is true. Cosmology, people study cosmology not because it's useful. It's, in some sense, the least useful subject possible, but because of its beauty. And so... I'll try and give some of uh, why I think cosmology is beautiful. Absolutely, very good. You know, in some sense, one of the slightly sad things about cosmology and astronomy in general, and maybe all sciences, is that we're moving towards an engineering model. Where the amounts of data are so large that it's, it, in a sense, it's losing its romance. Um, and that's definitely one of the trends. In amongst all this hype about how wonderful things are, is definitely a kind of a grieving of a loss of an era. Yeah. So that's one of the themes that I'll, I'll illustrate. But of course, there's upsides as well. Now, cosmologists uh, have uh, sometimes joked that every other subject in the universe is just a sub-branch of cosmology, because really, cosmology is the study of the universe and everything in it. So you know, this Carl Sagan quote, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And, and that is true, but it's also funny because we know so little about cosmology, about the universe, that to, to say that everything is a sub-branch of cosmology is, is kind of hysterical. But there's a, there's a very serious undercurrent to this, which is very important in the development of cosmology that we're going through, is that science has progressed on reductionism. Take this complex thing, you split off the thing that you are interested in, you take it away from all of its environment and you study this little thing in isolation. And that's worked wonderfully well. But the cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole. You, you can't take the whole thing and then split it up because now you're no longer studying the whole. And so in cosmology, we're struggling with what does it mean to do science with the whole universe? And that is one of the things we're trying to figure out. And I'll, explain, uh, I'll illustrate how that's an issue coming up more and more. So I just want to, the other thing, of course, is uh, most amateur astronomers that I know, I love the visual beauty of the night sky. Whether through a small telescope or through the naked eye, it's, it's something that's accessible on human timescales and on human you know, capabilities with that. And yet cosmology is really the study of the space in between the objects. It's asking, what happens to the space between the objects over cosmological times, over billions of years? And that means it's quite hard to, I think, there'll be a bunch of you going, I don't care about cosmology because, yeah, 
I can't see it. It's not about. Anyway, let me uh, start with one of the most basic concepts of cosmology, the fact that the universe is expanding. Um, I quite like this very, very kind of home way of showing it. Here's an image of, from the Hubble. Uh, let's imagine that we were sitting on that object. What would the expansion of the universe look like? Well, we can see that this object doesn't change at all, so locally we can't see the expansion of the universe. But every object has now moved away, further away from the central one. That, this thing is now there, this one is now there. And what you can see is that the objects close by don't get moved very much. The objects further away get uh, moved further away. So in other words, what this is showing is that the further away the objects are, the faster away they're moving. Okay. Of course, you might say, well, does that mean we're at the center of the universe? No, because we can instead imagine that we're sitting here, and then what would happen is this object. Now, everything would be looking like it's moving away from this object. So, for example, if we take that, this object moved from here to here, it's always moving on a radial a line, radially a wave. So everyone sees everyone moving away from them. And that's, that's how the universe can be expanding and yet have no center. So one of the things in cosmology we want to know is to understand this expansion rate. How is it changing with time? Has it always been expanding? Yeah. And eventually this leads us to, um, to the issues around the Big Bang. So one of the big things in cosmology that's going on has a, has a direct analogy in finance and in many other areas. So I don't know if you know about the flash crash of 2.45 2, 2 p.m. 2010. This was uh, five minutes in which Wall Street, Dow Jones, lost roughly 10% of its value, so a trillion dollars. Basically, no humans were involved. So this was, a uh, as far as we know, is a completely computer-generated crash. But within five minutes, the crash was, uh, was over. So for, for five minutes, the stock market lost a trillion dollars, and then they found it again. Yeah. But this is purely because of high-frequency traders. So now they're traders who tr make millions of trades every second. So with the power of high-performance uh, high computing and bandwidth that we now have, we're moving into a world which is more and more about computers and less and less about people. And I think that's inevitable. But it is, it, you know, it has this kind of, the sadness associated it for me in the fact that we're moving towards an engineering model of, of knowledge and not the more romantic kind of thing. Although cosmology is still pretty good because we still have to come up with the ideas. Um, it's just that the data is now being analyzed. And so I'm, I'm sure you've already had talks about the amount of data that we're going to have. So what is cosmology? I like this, uh, this quote from Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest actually in the Catholic Church. Um, he said, the evolution of the world, the cosmos, can be compared to a display of fireworks that has just ended. Some few red wisps, ashes and smoke, standing on a cool cinder we see the slow fading of the suns, and we try to recall the vanishing brilliance of the origin of the world. It's a very poetic definition of cosmology. Now what's very profound about this is that um, Einstein's equations, so these are Einstein's uh, uh, equations of general relativity, they basically relate the curvature of space on the left, space-time rather, with the amount of energy in space-time here. And this is Newton's constant which tells you how to convert from a pound of flesh into a bit of curvature of space. But the key point about these equations is they predict a Big Bang. They predict that the universe had to have come from a state of extremely high densities and temperatures. And that's what Lemaitre was talking about. We know that the universe had to have started off very hot and dense, and it's now very cooled and expanded, and we try to figure out this uh, explosion-like mechanism. And that means we have to understand the universe at very small scales. This is a bubble chamber plot from CERN. So this is incredibly small scales, 10 to the minus 15 meters. But to understand the origin of the universe, we have to understand physics at this scale because the characteristic size and density of the universe was this at some point. 
But we also have to understand the universe on the larger scale. You know, a billion light years across. And uh, that makes cosmology, of course, extremely difficult because it's like a combination of particle physics and astronomy. So this is sort of one of the things that kick-started modern cosmology. This is Hubble's, Hubble's uh, plot. It turns out that uh, Hubble's constant is, the, is this divided by this. So you can see that this is the speed of galaxies moving away. So this is 1,000 kilometers per second. And here's the distance that he estimated. This is 2 million parsecs, so 2 megaparsecs. So you can take 1,000 divided by 2, and you get 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. We now know that the true value is something like this, about 70 kilometers. And ironically, Hubble was actually not the first person to work out a, an, an estimate of Hubble's constant. He was actually the third person. But, you know, life isn't fair. And you know, this time, the third person got the name attached to it. You know. But in a sense, what we're trying to do is understand, you know, this is very close to us. Two, two megaparsecs is incredibly close to us in cosmological scales. But what we want to say, how is this rate of expansion of the universe changing with time? So what I can show you is, in 1996, uh, there was a big breakthrough. People figured out to look at, calculate distances much further away using supernovae, exploding stars. And you can see in 1996, there were a handful of objects, maybe 30, very close to us. And then there were this precious six objects, I think, at, uh, at big distances. In 1998, that had improved quite significantly. And for the first time in 1998, we had evidence that the universe was accelerating, that it was expanding but speeding up, not expanding and slowing down. In uh, 2007, we had added lots more data here. And in 2009, even more. So you can see we've gone from just a handful of objects in 10 or 12 years to having several hundred objects. And that this is the current state of the art with maybe a thousand supernovae in total. So this is a way of measuring uh, how, much the un how fast the universe is expanding um, uh, against how big the universe was in the past. Any questions? Sorry. Uh, yes. It's strange that one of the biggest variables in astronomy and cosmology is how it's constant. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, it turns out that Hubble's constant is incredibly hard to measure because we actually find it difficult to measure distances to even very near objects. You know, it's ironically, it's easier to measure a distance to, you know, when the universe was 10% younger than today. So, you know, huge distances than it is to measure to some stars, for example. You know, so, in fact, just because they're close doesn't actually help measure the, you know, expansions, for example. Yeah. But it actually is one of the limiting systematics. And, in fact, how are we ever going to know how fast the universe is expanding right this second? Because... When we use these objects, say, you know, these objects to measure the Hubble constant, we're actually looking back maybe 100 million years in the past. So we're actually not getting the expansion rate right now. We're getting it a bit in the past, where a bit is 100 million years. So one of the important things is the rise of statistics. So this block, which probably won't mean much to you, is the covariance matrix for this data. This tells you that these data points aren't actually independent. They're kind of related to each other. And this is crucial if you want to, if you want to make sense out of the data. And so this is part. As, the data, as we get more and more data, how you treat it has to get better and better. It's a bit like, I don't know if you've ever cooked with truffle, truffles. You know, truffles are unbelievably expensive, and you don't want to go and use the cheap spa oil or something with it. You want to cook it in a... You know, in the best possible way, and in a sense, that's what this data is. This is truffle data. You know, it's incredibly expensive to get, and so how we analyze it is is incredibly important. We have to do the best possible analysis. That's very technical. But the future is even more radical. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. I don't know if anyone's talked about it yet. It's a proposal for roughly 2020. So this is uh, you can see a um, uh, person here. It's an, it would be an 8-meter telescope, 8-meter mirror, with a 10-square-degree field of view. That's 40, 40 moons. It's 
in one snapshot. So salt, if you think about it, salt is roughly one sixtieth of a degree. So I think you need what? You need uh, 30 salt fields of view or 15 salt fields of view to get one moon. And this will get 40 moons at once. So it'll, it'll survey the sky every night, coming back every three days. So basically make a movie of the sky and incredibly deep, incredibly deep, because it's an eight meter telescope. So this is gonna revolutionize cosmology. Instead of, you know, now we have a thousand supernovae, that LSST will discover a million every year. So it's just gonna be, you know, in one night it will discover more supernovae than we, we know in the whole history of humanity. You know, every night we'll just double up what we know. So, so you know, with that amount of data, there's going to be no way that we can do old, old style astronomy. You know? So, yeah, I think that's very sad. I still, you know, you see, read these stories of um, Hubble going up to the prime focus, actually climbing up to the prime focus of the telescope, you know, Palomar. Yeah, now you don't even go to the telescope, of course. I think that's very, it's very exciting, but it's quite sad. The other thing we can do is we can look at the... Does anyone know what this is? Okay, so what is the CMB? The afterglow. Yes, exactly. But what's it actually... What are, what are we looking at? I mean... We're looking at variations in temperature. That's great. And what is this... Uh, what age was the universe when it emitted this? Three hundred thousand years, yes. And what happened at three hundred thousand years that we get this picture? Decoupling. Decoupling. Yes. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> I thought everyone's way too quiet. Yeah, I will turn this around, make it more entertaining. <laughs> yes, when the universe became transparent, exactly. Because you can see me and I can see you because the gas that we uh, in between us is neutral, right? It's not ionized. And that's what this is. When the universe cooled, it became, tr uh, it became neutral at some point. And when it became neutral, the light was able to... Tr if there was a thin film of plasma between us, we wouldn't be able to see each other because light can't go through the plasma. So this is actually this, like a plasma screen. Of, okay? <clears throat> Literally the face of the plasma TV screen. And we're looking at it. It's kind of a boring picture, actually. It's kind of like static, but... Uh, so that's a baby picture of the universe when it was 300,000 years old. And these tiny fluctuations, uh, although they're random, are, are not random completely. They're correlated. And that tells us about the conditions under which the universe was born. It tells us a lot. So I'll just run, view, uh, run you through what we've learned in the last, well, 20 years about this picture. So of course this is our best picture. Although in six months we're going to have a much better picture. So I have much, the Planck satellite is going to revolutionize cosmology. I won't talk about that, but that's going to be a mix. So 1990, uh, 1992 to 1996, this is what we had. We had so this is a statistical measure of, uh, of how much information we have. And you can see that we had a few points, and that was the best map we had. And then with time we started to fill in, and in fact, the Maxima and Boomerang in 2000 were very important because they detected this peak. And this peak was exactly at the position predicted if the universe was flat. So the great irony of, of uh, cosmology is that the Earth is round but the universe appears to be flat. And uh, we don't understand why that is. Because gravity sucks. Gravity makes things curve. And so why is the universe flat? It's unstable. It's like, imagine you'd come in here this morning and there was a giant pen standing on its edge. It'd be a bit weird, right? Because it's, it would be unstable. You know, if you push it a little bit, it'll fall over. Universes are the same. If, if it's flat and you give it a little nudge, it will become very curved. And so it's really weird that after 13 billion years, we come along and we find that the universe is flat. We don't really understand that. But anyway, let's carry on. So data kept improving in 2003, then WMAP came along, and this is the latest that we now have. So we have this amazing data with all these oscillations. 
going down to an incredibly small scale. As for me, who grew up, you know, uh, you know, who started doing research when we, we did, we only had the first four points over here. That's all there was, and now we have all of this beautiful map. And you can see this is the theoretical curve. You can see it fits the data beautifully. I mean, it's so, so what's the, the scale of the So yes, L is a spherical harmonic. <coughs> so it's basically 180. <coughs> 180 divided by the angle on the sky. So, uh, basically, L of 200 mm -hmm. corresponds to <laughs> one degree on the sky. So, the fact that there's a peak, actually, let me go back. If you look at this, it, on the surface it looks random, but you'll notice that there, there is a characteristic spot size of about one degree. Okay? And that's exactly this peak. The fact that it's telling you that you've got a the majority of the interesting stuff that's happening is happening on one uh, degree scale. But there's lots of information elsewhere, and so this is actually down at a very small scale. And in fact, for those of you who may wonder whether the universe is, uh, is actually expanding, these oscillations are a beautiful prediction of the oscillating universe, uh, the fact that the universe is expanding. Because in a plasma, so we say that the universe was uh, a plasma because it was hot. Okay? That's a consequence of the universe being smaller in the past. Because it was a plasma, the radiation has pressure. And the radiation under pressure just exhibits sound waves. And because it was hot, a plasma, it was coupled to the electrons. So the electrons were also oscillating. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. So those oscillations from the fact that the the radiation, the, the light, was coupled to matter. Now, if you believe that the universe is not expanding, then you have, there's no explanation for why there should be these oscillations. Anyway, a side <laughs> point. So how far, what have we learned since 1998? Well, this is the 1998 that I said, you know, we discovered that the universe is ex accelerating. Uh, here is the amount of dark matter. Here's the amount of Einstein's cosmological constant, his biggest blunder, which turned out to be true. And you can see that these contours, these are ways of saying, you know, for example, 99.7% confidence we live somewhere within this, our universe lives within this ellipse. So we didn't know very much. As of last year, we now know this, which if we translate onto the same scale, means that we now are confident we live in this tiny little dot. So it's like going from saying, ah, I know that we live somewhere in, America, in South Africa to saying, I live in somewhere in Pofada. We don't know where in Pofada, but for sure we live there now. You know, we now know. And look, it's miraculous. It's, it's exactly on this line corresponding to a flat universe. As I said before, we don't really understand why we live in a flat universe. It's, it's one of those mysteries because gravity should make things curve. Any questions about this? Could it be because the universe is lying on a flat space? It, it, except that the problem is Einstein's theory says if, there's an, if there were more matter, it would curve. Or if there were less matter, it would curve. So we have this kind of Goldilocks situation where we have just the right amount, density of matter. So that's actually the problem. Why have we got the Goldilocks so if you're religious, you could just say, well, you know, that's the way it was set up. But if you're a scientist who wants a, a more fundamental explanation, it's very mysterious. And the frustrating thing is we've tested Einstein's theory, and it works beautifully on smaller scales. So it could be that Einstein's theory is actually wrong on very large scales, but it's okay for the solar system. That's one of the possibilities. So this is the, you know, the, obviously because cosmologists are interested in space, but the, you can't see space, we have to use the stuff in that we can see as probes of space itself. So here's a map, basically our current best map of the galaxies in the universe. So each one of these dots, if I zoom in, is a galaxy with 100 billion stars. And you can see that it's not just random. There is a characteristic kind of, there are voids and there are walls. There's a fingerprint structure to this. And that fingerprint structure is 
exactly what we expect. It's ready to go. That fingerprint structure is the grown up version of this. This fingerprint structure, with the help of gravity, turns, or at least this is what cosmologists will try and tell you, turns into this gravity. So it's a beautiful cross match. It's a bit like taking a, a baby's fingerprints when they're six weeks old then taking fingerprints when they're 30 and comparing them, we can check that they match. And indeed, they do match very well. Sorry, yes? So about that one side. I'm presuming that those concentric rings is just to do with the instrumentation. Or the Absolutely, yes, yes. So we are at the center of this map, sorry. Mm -hmm. And these big holes are just the fact that we, our telescopes are very small. And yes, these concentric rings uh, are not real. In fact, um, in some ways this is a very bad approximation to our universe it's just that we tend because we've had very limited resources to survey in little strips and stuff here so of course a lot of this has been driven by the, the revolution computers uh, I always like this quote although it's attributed to Thomas Watson I don't think it was him yeah. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers and what's fascinating of course is that in the old days they used to use the word computer, but it was used for people. There were people, mostly women, who sat down and did calculations by hand. Hubble had them, and they got zero credit. I mean, it was really slave labor in some ways in the modern picture. They got zero credit, and they did a lot of, a lot of the work. So I'm going to show you a simulation, because this is the other thing that's been driving a lot of our progress recently. So this is a computer simulation of one of these universes. Um, it's called the Millennium Simulation. And what are we going to do? So this is one gigaparsec. So this is roughly a billion light years across. And we're going to zoom in just to show you that, in a sense, the problem with cosmology is you cannot separate what's happening on very large scales from what's happening on very small scales. So this is the dark matter density. So the, the black parts are, are voids where there's basically nothing. So remember Hubble measured out to two megaparsecs. So this 125 <coughs> is 50 times bigger than what Hubble was looking at in his original analysis. So we're zooming in on a very big cluster of galaxies. And you can see this filamentary structure, this kind of fingerprint structure. This is at a fixed time. Yes, this is today. So this is today, we're just zooming in. I'll show you a time evolution match later. So now we're about to get to the scale that Hubble was looking at. You know, distance is about two megaparsecs. So each one of these dots would be a galaxy, <coughs> or a dwarf galaxy. And now we'll zoom out. So try and keep your eye on that central cluster. So that's roughly the scale of the universe that we can observe. And the game in, in modern cosmology is to run a simulation like this and then compare it with what we see and go, do they match? Kind of, kind of criminal CSI. Uh, on a, on a very large scale. So now I'm going to do a, a different thing. I'm, we're going to focus on one cluster and watch it evolve from the time when the universe was, I think, 15 times smaller than it is today to today. And you'll see this cosmic dance of mergers and tidal stripping. You can see gravity is amplifying the small fluctuation. You can see it flowing in along the filaments. So now the universe is half its current size. Now we zoom out a bit. This is today. And now I'll just rotate to have a look at the structure. And one of the things this shows is that we want to use these objects to learn about how space is evolving, but we can't do that until we understand these objects. And what this kind of shows you is that 
understanding these objects is incredibly difficult because there's so much going on. And so, um, but this is a model, for example, of the brightest cluster galaxies, the galaxies that sit at big clusters, and they do look very similar to that. That's kind of suggests that we we have we do know roughly what's going on. Any questions? Would you like to see that again? Sometimes watching these is better than <laughs> and listening to someone rabbit on. Is, is this the photo? <coughs> yeah, in a sense it is. Um, if you look at this, you can see this uh, these voids and walls. These are three-dimensional kind of coffee, kind of cup foam structures. And these are predicted. The beautiful thing is we predict that these come from the first microsecond of the universe's uh, history when the universe was expanding very fast and it, because it was so small there were quantum fluctuations and those quantum fluctuations are actually what led to this foam structure. So, sure. yes, yeah. When you said it was predicted, so you, you built the models of potential uh, exactly. to these, this data and then exactly. the base model. So I'll give you an example. There's a theory called inflation which was invented to explain why the universe is flat. Someone then noted, oh, but if this is true, there would be quantum fluctuations which would get stretched by the expansion of the universe. So quantum fluctuations are tiny, of course, but the universe expanded so much that they became giant like this. So in this model, every galaxy, every cluster of galaxies actually came out of a quantum fluctuation. So it's an incredibly poetic picture. And it turns out that it's the best pick model that we have. It doesn't mean it's true, but currently by far the best model that we have. And that's what Planck is going to try and do is test that. You know, hopefully it will find that it's wrong because that's how science really progresses. You know. It's a bit like the discovery of the Higgs at the LHC. It's kind of disappointing because it's much more exciting if you find things that you didn't expect. So, you know, despite all this amazing progress, this picture is still appropriate in cosmology because there are a lot of things that we have no understanding of. We have a model for why the universe may be flat, but uh, it's not very ap appealing, and there are lots of other mysteries. Then I would say this is the best picture of the universe that we have today. You know, this is my, my uh, summary of the universe. It took quite a long time to remove all the keys uh, in Photoshop. <laughs> so... So basically, we know uh, the cosmic keyboard, we know that they are about 4% in helium and hydrogen. The rest we don't know about. There's dark matter, which is a bit like these keys, because you can use, you know, what do you do when you type? You write a word, and then you cluster the words into sentences, and sentences into paragraphs. So you, you build up bigger and bigger blocks of text. And dark matter does the same. It allows us to make galaxies, and then clusters of galaxies, and then superclusters. But you also have things like the space bar, which is what we think this dark energy is that's causing the universe to ex uh, accelerate. So this is our current, uh, you know, one of our basic models. There's a big bang, which is really just a, a word that we use for saying we have no idea. Okay? Okay? So when someone says the big bang doesn't exist, it, it's kind of a tautology because it's like saying... This thing that we don't know doesn't exist, you know. Well, we simply don't know how to make any predictions beyond a certain time in the past. The whole, all of the laws of physics break down, and it, it's really just a don't go, because we don't know what's over there, you know, watch out. Then there's this prediction idea of inflation, then decelerated expansion. And then at some time, about 5 billion years ago, for reasons that we don't know, the universe appears to have started to accelerate, to speed up. It's getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster. But that's really weird because it's a bit like you throw this up and then it starts to come down and then suddenly it disappears. And gravity seems to change character quite recently. Really, really weird. And it kind of reminds me of this joke uh, from an exam. Peter was asked to expand A plus B to the N. You know, it should be A to the N plus and said he just expanded and it broke up and made, and made it wider. <laughs> and what I particularly like this is that if you fit for the cur the curve of expansion, it's actually a good model. <laughs> it's 
is, is there's the big bang and then deceleration and then acceleration. Yeah. So Peter had it, had it figured out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very funny, Peter. Not <laughs> there, there's a there's a bigger question. You know, the the strange thing about this is that. You know, Earth was formed roughly around 5 billion years ago, roughly when the universe mm -hmm. appears to have started accelerating. And that suggests that we live at a special time in the history of the universe. And if you think about Cop the Cop Copernican ideas, is we don't, we're not special, whether in space or time. So people have been asking, well, maybe instead of living at a special time, maybe what would happen if we actually did live at the center of the universe? And it turns out that you can explain the data, the supernova data about the acceleration of the universe, if by sitting in a universe that where we're at the center. So it appears that the Copernican principle is wrong, either in space or time. And you know, the beautiful thing is that within 20 years we'll be able to test which one is correct. So you know, we'll be able to definitively answer. Because I've had a lot of non-cosmologists say, how can you? How can you call yourself a scientist when you use this Copernican principle as a, as a basis without being able to test it? Fortunately, within 20 years, we'll know, are we at the center of the universe? Or we'll disprove it, or we'll prove it. So that's very exciting. So, um, the, so in a universe that doesn't have the Copernican, that does have the Copernican principle, where we're not at a special time, uh, not at a special place, the important thing is that you can zoom in on two completely separate boxes and they'll basically be identical. So in such a universe there is no center. But we don't know whether we live in such a universe. Okay, so just very quickly, I know I'm running out of time, sorry. Um, just some things to look out for you might hear in the press uh, releases in the next couple of years. One thing is the direct or the indirect detection of dark matter. So here's um, from the Fermi satellite. If you look at the center of the galaxy, Fermi and WMAP and several other types of probes seem to see an excess, very large, you know, it's not, it's not point sources, it doesn't appear to be point sources, and it's been called the haze. And this may well be coming from decays of dark matter that either uh, decay eventually into electrons that give you synchrotron radiation or into gamma rays. So I think we, there's a good chance we'll detect dark matter within the next three years, say. Gravitational lensing of the CMB, as light travels, if there's a mass, the mass will bend space and time, and so the light gets bent. And so um, we've now detected this effect. So this is a simulation of what happens to the CMB as it travels through. You can see it's a tiny shift, but we've now detected that for the first time. And in fact, we've got beautiful detections of it, the South Pole Telescope. Then something with, uh, related to uh, radio telescopes. We know that the universe was neutral for most of its history. But then uh, roughly, um, well, f again, a few billion years ago, it became ionized. It's called reionization. We think it was due to the first stars switching on, but this is something that LOFAR and SKA will, will do a lot of. And of course, SALT uh, will continue to do a lot of good work. Um, let me just uh, show you an image that we took, actually. So 250 million years, a supernova exploded. You can see it's, it's that little thing. Um, and uh, so the light traveled for 250 million years. Fortunately, it wasn't cloudy, so we were able to take the image. Um, and I mean, this is the beauty of cosmology. It's really archaeology, in a sense, cosmic archaeology, because, you know, for you think about T-Rex was only, was only 65 million years ago on Earth. Anyway, so we... Uh, so, just a, a summary of what can we expect in the next 15 years. Well, ongoing now, Meerkat, LOFAR, and ASCAP, they're all radio telescopes that are, in some sense, operating. There's the Dark Energy Survey, which has got a lot of press recently. BBC, etc. has just started. Pan Stars. These are these are again imaging. They take pictures of the, sky, of the night sky, hundreds of millions of objects. LSST, I mentioned probably 2020, Euclid and Big Bust, these will take uh, spectra, hundreds of millions of spectra of, uh, of galaxies. So we'll build a much bigger three dimensional map of the universe. And then finally, SKA will get a billion regions. So 
Um, so, you know, um, in that sense, I think SKA is the natural endpoint at the moment uh, for these kind of studies. And I think these will be amazing data sets, not just for cosmology, but for all astronomy, because to get to the cosmology, we have to look through everything else, so the galaxy. So, yeah, and uh, so I think even for amateur astronomy, it's going to kickstart a, a revolution. And I would love to see uh, a way for uh, amateur astronomers to engage in real science with the data that's available. Because now it's all available. There's nothing to stop people from doing their own analysis. And I think uh, that would be a real kind of citizen science rather than the kind of galaxy zoo citizen science. But I'll just end by saying that cosmology... It's a, it's a very interesting uh, situation because I love this quote from Jacob Bronowski. He said, the most remarkable discovery ever made by scientists was science itself. And I, I think that's very beautiful. But as I said, cosmology has to do something new because you can't, you can't use reductionism on the whole universe. So we have to actually figure out a new way of doing science in the context of doing everything in a kind of holistic way. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. We have time for two questions. Do we have any questions? Okay. Well, we'll go to back then. Uh, well, we do the cosmology thing in our whole study of the whole structure thing. At what stage does it get too complicated? Because if you start with the last class right here, you have to go in and zoom in and zoom in. Well, for, that's it's very hard, and people will disagree. Fortunately, fortunately people disagree on it. So there's, there's a number of things you can do. You can say, well, what you can do is you can get uh, some people specialising in studying stars, for example, some people studying galaxies, and some people doing cosmology. And then you try to interface what the different disciplines know, and you patch it together. So that's, that's what we currently do with reductionism. Everyone does their own bit, and then we try and paste them together. But often the boundaries are problematic. And often the communities don't want to speak to each other. You know, Brian would, will tell you stories of like how many cosmologists speak to stellar astronomers and vice versa. It's very few. And they, everyone loves to make jokes about each other. You know, they, they're not real scientists. You know. so, so I think you know, we're limited often by, uh, by uh, personality things as well. But computationally, you just do as much as you can. And you know, we'll never have enough computing power to do it all. So it can't just be bigger computers, actually. Do you have a question there? You mentioned gravitational lensing of the high Yes. Uh, How do you tell that? How do you know? Oh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, just trying to think of a, a that's, it's, it's such a subtle thing, it's quite hard to explain. Let me see. Um, <coughs> it turns out that um, if you didn't have gravitational lensing, gravitational lensing links what happens over here, over there, over there, and over there are not independent. So if you take, for example, four points, what happens at those four points is not independent anymore. Whereas the standard prediction was that they would be independent. So they become linked in a very subtle but very specific way. So you, it becomes this, uh, there's a prediction that if you look at all possible four points, okay, you should see a signal that wouldn't be there if the lensing wasn't there. So, um, but it's very difficult to explain that. So it's a very good question, but it's, it's, to, it's, it's a statistical prediction. It's a prediction about the nature of the temperature fluctuations that you can't really pick up here because... Uh, um, there's a pattern you're expecting, but it's not quite right. It, it def it, there's a, it's a distortion to the pattern. And so we know what the distortion should be, and we can go and isolate it. We can go and look for it. Okay. It's a, a, technically, it's a non-Gaussian predic non prediction. The standard fluctuations of Gaussian is a non-Gaussian prediction.
Okay, we're going to stop there, and um, we'd like to express our appreciation. Some small token from the hosts.